episode 70 of Grace and Steel. I'm Kevin Steele. And I'm Kevin and Michael Grace. Our topic is Canada, Kingdom of the Cucks. Americans were mildly diverted this week when Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau paid a visit to President Trump. As some of our American listeners know, politically, Trump and Trudeau don't see eye to eye on a few key issues. Trump is a nationalist. Trudeau is a post-nationalist. Trump wants to limit immigration. Trudeau wants to throw open the doors to ever more immigration, a la Angela Merkel. Whatever Trump is, he certainly is no shitlib. Trudeau is a shitlib, and as shitlibs go, the Canadian boy emperor is D plus ultra. Here's something Americans need to understand. The term shitlib has no meaning in Canada. We're all shitlibs here, or at least 99% of us. Take the word cuckservative, cuck for short. Last year, this insult was introduced into the American political vocabulary. A portmanteau of the word cuckled, the husband of an adulterous wife, and conservative, it is a term of derision aimed at establishment conservatives who have spent their careers kowtowing to liberals and cultural Marxists while paying only lip service, if that, to the project of conserving what is valuable in Western culture. Conservatives live in a constant fear that a single unfortunate word will lead to accusations of being racist, misogynist, or homophobic, which would invariably ruin them professionally and socially. Consequently, they conserve nothing but their precious jobs at media organizations, at think tanks, etc., the alt-right in the U.S. exposed and humiliated the cucks last year. That hasn't happened in Canada. Perhaps because it can't. In Canada, cucks don't control the conservative movement. They are the conservative movement. They are unopposed. Shitlib? Cuck? Why not say instead, Canadian? We live in a monoculture. No dissenting opinions are allowed. Kevin, am I being too harsh or are we really kingdom of the cucks? No, you're not being uh, too harsh. We are the kingdom of the cucks. And I was thinking that this subject reminds me of a famous essay by Alexander Solzhenitsyn from 1974 called Live Not By Lies. And he asks for Russians or people of the Soviet Union to commit to personal non-participation in lies. Though lies conceal everything, though lies embrace everything, but not with any help from me. What we have seen in Canada, there are two steps. Come on, live by lies. Come on, you know you want to. You know that this is the way to get ahead in Canada. Everyone else is doing it. You don't want to be left out. And then we got to the stage where we're like Winston Smith at the end of 1984. You know, a single gin-scented tear trickles down his face, and he says, I love Big Brother. And he really does love Big Brother. It's not so much in Canada that, as you suggested in your introduction, that, oh, people are willingly lying. It's that they don't know any different. That there is a false vision of the world that obtains in this country and it was quite some time ago when Canadians or anyone who wanted to get ahead in this country, achieve some sort of position, decided, I, you know, I'm not even going to flirt with a dissident opinion. Uh, let the vanguard show the way. What do I have to do next? And I'll do it. I'll do whatever I have to do. There's been occasions in recent years. Michael Corrin's a very good example. He was considered a right winger. He's a he's written books, talked about the Catholic religion, newspaper columnist, radio host, and it's clear to me that what happened with this fellow was that he realized that he was no longer publishable in Canada, and so his views changed. He is now he now loves Big Brother, and he is once again welcome in the Canadian media. That presupposes, though, that there is a the ability to dissent, you know, when you say he was on the right wing. I mean, he was nominally right wing, or was he actually right wing, and and that was allowed. I mean, that's pretty much what you're suggesting here, which negates my intro, that's all. I mean, well, that, no, 
If you look at what counts for dissent in this country, I suppose you have the Sun newspapers. And, well, there's Ezra Levant's organization, right? That's it. Well, even, if you look, if you even look at the, the Sun, Sun, if you yeah. look at the Sun newspapers, what you get largely is, oh, this is terrible, and oh, this shouldn't happen, and then it happens, and uh, it's a slippery slope. We move further down the slippery slope, and oh, well, you know, this shouldn't happen, and we'll raise our voice against that well, mildly for the most part, and then we'll lose that battle, and it goes on and on and on. Yeah, pretty much what was happening in the in Western society, whether it be England or the United States. But I'm sure our American audience is quite familiar with how the battle is lost through. Cook's well, I, I want to dogma. say something to our American audience. Uh, when we began this podcast, we made a rule we violated a couple of times that we're not going to talk about Canada because it's of little interest to Americans for various reasons. And we wanted now, to target an American audience. Well, yeah. I will say that Americans should pay attention to this because Canada is a terrible warning of what will happen to you if you do not take heed. Now, I realize I've made myself open to attacks on my own patriotism because of this stance. And I will say in my defense that I believe that Canada is in many ways a, a saner and more pleasant country to live in the United States. On the other hand, if one has any intellectual honesty, it is increasingly intolerable. There is no yeah. limit to the degradation that we are expected to embrace. There is, Canada is, you could say, saner and more pleasant because it's a consensus nation in which people are expected to believe the same things big problem with the consensus nation is that under the right circumstances or with the right leaders in charge, it becomes uh, authoritarian, even totalitarianism. There, there's a soft totalitarianism. Is Ted Morton, I believe, the, the former Alberta cabinet minister, mm -hmm. uh, university professor who came up with this phrase. Canada is a soft totalitarian country and is becoming ever less soft as time goes by. Well, we had eight years of so-called conservative, nine years of so-called conservative government, wasn't it? Uh, with uh, Harper in the prime ministership. Did that do nothing for us here? I know that they repealed one section of the uh, Human Rights Code that had to do with, I think it was proof. That was it. That was about as far back as they went. But I mean... Did you feel well, more I'll just, I'll just say some, I'll say something about that. That It, it was good that the Harper government, uh, I believe this may have been a private member's bill, took the teeth out of our um, human rights code. Uh, that is to say, the, the secular version. The, 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 pro, the criminalization of speech still exists in the criminal code. Mm -hmm. Now, Harper, uh, after posing as a champion of free speech for many years, Stephen Harper told Ken White that he thought that these restrictions on free speech were a good idea, and they didn't really have much of a problem uh, with, I don't know, the conditions in this country. Harper was a neoconservative. That's what he was. Uh, what did he care about? Israel, uh, Afghanistan. Whatever else he cared about was rather a mystery. Now, I, I'll ask you if you agree or disagree. I know you think that I've been too hard on Stephen Harper, but I really don't think that he he stood for anything outside of neoconservatism, although you might disagree. Uh, there was some nominal uh, derp derp and uh, definitely some libertarian stuff in there, a uh, balanced budget. The guy's whole concentration was on uh, economy. He was an economist by training. So I don't think he was totally new. Jobs, 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 and the awesome majesty of the free market, which must be unleashed. Except that when, you know, we're participating in the, the crony capitalism, which has characterized Canada for uh, many decades and which you have written about extensively. Right. Well, that's different than Afghanistan, isn't it? Okay. 
That's okay. a, that's all I'm saying, right? You know, and neocons they uh, they had their concentration on foreign policy. Harper did have his economic focus on the free market and uh, you know libertarian principles that that type of thing. The Calgary School, as some called it, because that's where he had uh, studied. So uh, yeah, I I mean in hindsight now I don't think you can be too hard on Stephen Harper while he was in there. I mean I really saw no other options. I mean, you want to go back to the liberals? Well, here we are. You can criticize Stephen Harper all you want, but now we're back to the liberals. Where are you going to go? Are you going to go farther left than that, the NDP? Mind you, as I'm discovering in Alberta, it doesn't seem to make much difference who's in power, uh, since we do live in this monoculture. So I'm less apt to uh, criticize you for criticizing Harper. Other than I, that, I wanted to talk about this, uh, this column which appeared last week by a woman called uh, Leah or Leah McLaren. Oh, this is a beaut, yeah. Well, I first uh, learned about this woman about 20 years ago when she was this uh, star in the Canadian media, notwithstanding the fact that she was 21 years old or whatever. She, I, I suppose she's best described as a superannuated cutie. Uh, she's now uh, translated uh, herself into, what do they call it, yummy mummy? Is that the term? I don't know. I only see one picture of her, so... Well, she writes all these columns, and she's always mentioning that you know she has children. You know, you know, good for you, sweetie. Uh, mm -hmm. Children are they? They're the future of the human race, and all that. But there's always this vested interest there. Oh well, you know, I actually deign to have children, so you must pay attention to me. Uh, she wrote this column on discovering the word cuck. <laughs> Now, this woman is either ignorant or dishonest. I this would go the ignorant. Well, okay. Well, I mean, she's said to be, you know, she's university educated and all that. She has been in the media. Cuckold is a word which has been common for hundreds of years. And uh, if you're familiar with literature, you know the word. Hey, if you saw Wes Anderson's movie, The Royal Tenenbaums, you know the word because uh, Bill Murray complains that Gwyneth Paltrow has fitted him with a cuckold's horns. Yeah. Well, I mean, you told me to read this thing. Take a look at this, because this uh, astounded you. And, you know, when you were talking about it, uh, her not knowing the word cuckold, I thought, well, everybody has blind spots. But, you know, when you're a columnist, you have an opportunity to look things up. You know, like maybe check a dictionary, Discover that yeah, the word I don't goes know. back to 1463 in Old French. If you're of a mind to do that sort of thing. I'll, I'll just read uh, the first two paragraphs from this column in the Globe and Mail. Let's talk about swearing. I love a grubby old curse word, don't you? I'm an unapologetic user of the F-bomb and the S-bomb, and even very occasionally when the idiot home office printer breaks again. Mm -hmm. The ever-controversial C-bomb. The guidelines for uttering profanity in my house are like the 70s rules for spanking. Only grown-ups can do it, but not during a fight and never with intent to cause harm. Which brings me to this brand new swear I recently discovered while visiting Twitter. That delightful bastion of conflict and insult. The word is cuck, and in case you haven't heard it, it's bad. So bad I can hardly believe it's printable in this newspaper. It probably won't be after I explain what it means. You like that last sentence? I am yeah. going to stop the Globe and Mail from using this word because that's what columnists do. Yeah. They are word police. Well, maybe she uh, knew of the word, and uh, but this isn't uh, tongue-in-cheek at all. You know, I mean, she's obviously as you say, on a mission here to make sure that this is put outside the realm of uh, polite society, right? Well, polite society, she talks about porn, right? Well, polite and, society you know, is... And white woman, black porn. man porn, right? Oh, I see. I thought you were in favor of such transgressive things, but never mind that. Oh, here we go. Case in point, white supremacist David Dukes, blah, blah, blah. Oh, <laughs> David Duke! David Duke, he's that well-known leader of the alt-right. Uh, David Duke has such tremendous power and influence in the United nobody States. Nobody listens to David Duke. But anyways, no, yeah. nobody, nobody listens to like David Duke. The, and then she, so. see, there is this woman called Kelly Leach, who is running for the conservative leadership 
uh, to replace Stephen Harper. They've had a temporary leader. I won't go into this woman. She's irrelevant. But Kelly Leach has uh, been called Canada's Donald Trump. And she had this campaign manager who seemed, to me at least, uh, woke. Her name was Nick Kuvallis. Described as a prominent conservative political strategist responsible for the campaigns of Conservative Party leadership hopeful Kelly Leach, Toronto Mayor John Tory, and the late Rob Ford. Well, he used this word cuck. In a tweet, yeah. Yes, Mm -hmm. in a tweet. And he has since resigned, a.k.a. been fired as Leach's campaign manager. Yes. Well, it it would seem likely. And so then, okay, so it's not enough that we got Kuvalis' scalp. Mm -hmm. You know, in the wake of the Quebec City massacre, blah, blah, blah. Oh, John Tory. Oh, he's a hypocrite because, what, he hasn't announced someone who worked for him years ago? This is how it works in Canada. Who are you denouncing today? Are you sure you're denouncing enough people? Because we can never have the just society unless we become like the East Germany of the Stasi. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, On that regard, I think that at this moment, uh, since uh, you have used the word cuck, I'm going to take this opportunity to fire you. And now you can fire me. (laughs) Go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 no. (laughs) You you see, the, 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 the... This is one of the most amusing things about the rise of the alt-right, that for 50 years, roughly, you know, since the free speech movement in Berkeley, that, oh, can't you take a joke, dad? Mm, Or fuck you if you can't take a joke. That these, what you call civility, I call repression, and we are going to smash it. And then, last year, oh, Donald Trump and the alt-right, oh my God, they're so uncivil. What can we do about that? I can't believe how uncivil this word they're using. It's the worst word in the world. Please save we, us. Yeah, let's temporarily uh, invoke uh, civility uh, until the uh, election, at which point they revoked it again. So it was only a, a matter of, I think, a couple of months that uh, civility was uh, in place. And in Canada, of course, you know, they, they are invoking it. Your Leah McLarens are trying to invoke it here to shut down debate. They're, they're basically well, a couple, trying to a couple shut down of, the return we, a of couple politics. of weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, uh, a, a man called uh, Alexander Bissonnette mm. of Quebec City, uh, he's been charged with the murder of uh, six Muslims in a mosque and the wounding of what uh, a dozen or so more. And well, it turns out that this guy was a notorious alt right shit poster. CBC and other news more organizations have repeated this claim. Repeatedly, uh, there's no evidence of it. Let's see the tweets. Let's see the Facebook posts, huh? Huh? Come on. There aren't any. Well, I don't know if there aren't any. They haven't shown us any. Whenever something, whenever some, well, well, they haven't shown us any. They haven't shown us any. uh, Sorry, that's typical of the media. They plant a line of BS, you know, and then at that point, once it's in the database of the official news organizations, uh, it's not LexisNexis here. There was an Infomart or something like that. Once it's in there, we can repeat it ad nauseum, you know, as if it's verifiable fact without doing any checking on it at all. So that's what they've done. Well, the stories Mm -hmm. indicated that this Bissonnette fellow was supposedly being watched. Now, if he was being watched, you would simply copy some tweets, right? Mm -hmm. Do screen caps if you had to, so you had a record of this. And the fact that no evidence was produced strongly suggests to me there is no such evidence And it's another situation that whenever there is some sort of public atrocity, all the white people say, oh, please, not a white guy, not a white guy, not a white guy. All the white people, except for the SJW and the good white people, the Mm -hmm. decent white people say, please, please, a white guy, please, a white guy, please, a white guy. This time they got their wish and they are pressing their advantage. Uh, Uh, They seem to have stopped, though. We have this, well, we'll see, you know, look, here's the thing. I would suggest that if uh, Alexander Bissonnette, who of course has not been convicted of anything, but if there is strong evidence that uh, he is a uh, Anders Breivik sort of figure, this information would be leaked 
by mm. the authorities to the CBC and other news organizations, and we'd have shocking exposés. Right? Well, yeah, but here it, they went to the legislative uh, agenda a lot quicker than they did, say, the last time we had a mass shooting that was treated in the same sort of disinformation way. Uh, that is that they've already got this uh, bill before the House of Commons uh, regarding Islam. It's not a bill. It's a motion. Oh, sorry. A motion. Okay, it's a motion. Sorry. A motion. Yeah. So they've already, and, uh, they're already throwing let, Yeah, let's there, talk so. about that. Let's talk about that. Ikra Khalid, who is the Canadian liberal politician who has brought forward this anti-Islamophobia motion, represents the writing of Mississauga Aaron Mills. Now, the thing that has to be understood about suburban Toronto, uh, Mississauga, Scarborough, Markham, is that these writings are, not to put too fine a point on it, no longer Canadian. John McCallum, who was the immigration minister and is now the ambassador to China, uh, according to the 2011 census, his writing of Markham Thornhill was 82% visible minority. 82%. Mm. So that gives you an idea of what has happened to the city of Toronto. Ikra Khalid, uh, she is a Pakistani Muslim, and she has not hesitated uh, to use this mass killing in Quebec City as an excuse to ram this down our throat. Now I'm, I'm going to read this to you, just so everyone, just so everyone knows what the whole impact is, because there's been a lot said about this. That it will lead to this. Oh, no, of course it won't lead to that. You're a white right-wing extremist for objecting. Here's the text. That, in the opinion of the House, the government should A, recognize the need to quell the increasing public climate of hate and fear, B, condemn Islamophobia and all forms of systemic racism and religious discrimination, and take note of House of Commons petition E4111 and the issues raised by it, and C, Request that the Standing Committee on Canadian Heritage undertake a study on how the government could, one, develop a whole-of-government approach to reducing or eliminating systemic racism and religious discrimination against, including Islamophobia, in Canada, while ensuring a community-centered focus with a holistic response through evidence-based policymaking, two, collect data to contextualize hate crime reports and to conduct needs assessments for impacted communities, and that the committee should present its findings and recommendations to the House no later than 240 calendar days from the adoption of this motion, provided that in its report the committee should make recommendations that the government may use to better reflect the enshrined rights and freedoms in the Constitution Acts, including the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Now, this uh, motion is moving ahead in the House of Commons. And uh, now, let's talk about this word Islamophobia. This is a, uh, a boogeyman word, and it, it derived uh, largely from the use, the success of homophobia. Now, Islamophobia means fear of Islam. Now, I would argue, as many others, that we are, uh, are right to fear Islam. But, uh, Apparently, this is a very bad thing. Now, here is the key. Develop a whole of government, whole of government approach to reducing or eliminating systemic racism and religious discrimination, including Islamophobia in Canada. Racism and religious discrimination are part of life everywhere in the world. They have always been. And so to move to eliminate it is to seek a totalitarian society. It's that simple. Yeah, that is what we are seeking. I mean, it's pretty easy. It would be easier to do in Canada than anywhere else, I suppose. You know, they've uh, they've got pretty much everyone on side with it. So I don't think the conservatives are opposing this at all. Now, I'm reading a Huffington Post piece uh, condemning the attacks on this uh, motion, which, of course, everyone should support, right? Well, yeah, for sure. Uh, there's the a... The House of Commons unanimously passed a motion to condemn all form of Islamophobia in November after an online petition generated nearly 70,000 
signatures, unanimously passed the motion. You cringing cowards, you revolting men and women, unanimously passed a motion to condemn all forms of Islamophobia. Now, a great many of the people who voted for this, they don't realize that they're cutting their own throats, but that is the nature of the conservative, that the conservative doesn't understand that everything that he does brings him closer to his own elimination. Now, it, it gets better. All forms of racism are interconnected. They are not separate, Khalid said. People who are targeted by Islamophobia include Sikhs, Arabs, and Black Canadians, and other, many other minority groups. Now, she has a personal interest in this. Now, um, I suppose we should put out of our minds the idea that you know, her family came from Pakistan to here, presumably because they thought that it was better. Uh, not not a lot of gratitude there hmm. from Ms. Khalid. When I moved to Canada in the 1990s, a young girl trying to make this nation my home. Oh, really? Is that how children look at the situation? <laughs> a young girl trying to make this nation my home. Some kids in my school would yell as they pushed me, go home, you Muslim. But I was home. Khalid said when she introduced the motion in Parliament, I am among thousands of Muslims who have been victimized because of hate and fear. We have this uh, conservative named Michael Chong, who is uh, a Canadian leadership ca conservative party leadership candidate, whose campaign seems to be based on the fact that as a Hapa, as uh, the son of a Chinese father and a Dutch mother, he was similarly bullied in school. Yeah. The personal is the political and is also the sociological. Children are bullied in school for all sorts of reasons. I'm going to suggest that anyone over the age of, say, 25 who carries on about schoolyard bullying that didn't result in, oh, I don't know, serious injury, is a bad person full stop. Now, you know, immigrants come to uh, another country, they are different, and their differences are noticed. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. I mean, Oh, no, I had a difficult childhood. Well, no, uh, you had such a difficult childhood that, that you ended up in the uh, House of Commons. How old? Is, this woman is 30 years old. I know. She's mm -hmm. 30 years old. And she was elected at the age of 29. And, oh, she worked as a legal professional for the city government of Mississauga. So that is to say, as soon as she graduated from school, she got hooked into the power. Mm -hmm. And uh, now she is uh, attempting to eliminate systemic racism in this country, which suggests to me that she is a rather powerful person indeed. Though but, somewhat diluted, if uh, you take human nature into account, unless she's going to drug us all. No, I mean, just, I, well, I, I just, you know, it it's happens. one thing to be against this motion, and Kelly Leach has come out against it. Others have come out against it. I would like to see someone say what I'm saying, hmm. that maybe this woman should shut the hell up, and that if she doesn't like it here in Canada, because it is so bloody Islamophobic, Go home. No one will miss you. I don't think we're that Islamophobic here. No, I don't think Probably we're that be. Islamophobic. Yeah. Uh, could be worse. Either. Uh, I've just recently moved in Victoria, and I had occasion to pass by the mosque, which was about uh, two, three blocks away from where I lived until uh, two weeks ago. And there was a woman, an elderly white woman, standing in front of the mosque as I passed it on Thursday morning. She was holding up a sign saying that she was there as a witness to the right of Canadians to pray without violence. This is obviously in response to the uh, Quebec City killings. Now, yeah. when there's uh, Islamic uh, atrocities uh, around the world, and they're frequent, um, as everyone knows, I don't recall you know, Islamic people... Uh, making the silent witness in front of Christian churches or synagogues or the like. And that's because Canada is a cuck-servative 
country. You know, yeah. after uh, after the Quebec City uh, massacre, this fellow Jason Kenney, who wants to become premier of Alberta and looks to have a fairly decent shot at it. Yeah, he was a longstanding uh, cabinet minister under Stephen Harper. Uh, he was minister of immigration, minister of defense, minister of multiculturalism. He let the world know that he was responsible for prioritizing gay Iranian refugees coming to Canada. Now, yeah, uh, when, I, when I knew Jason Kenney uh, two decades ago, uh, he was about two things. Uh, he was about the power of the free market. And uh, he was also pro-life. And he was so pro-life that I'm exceedingly pro-life myself. It got to be rather irritating because there was seemingly nothing that happened in the world that didn't ultimately have to do with pro-life. We don't hear much from Jason on those two subjects these days because it's all about immigrants and how better they are than Canadians. Well, under oh, Harper, he so, was, yeah, under Harper, yeah, they're he just was so the immigration darn, minister, though. They're just the so answer. darn entrepreneurial and they're smarter than us and they work harder than us. That's not what the Fraser Institute, that's not what their data shows. Hmm. That they uh, earn less and they they use much more in the way of welfare resources and they are a considerable net drain to the Canadian economy. But when Jason Kenney was immigration minister, multiculturalism minister, he just met with endless supplicants who wanted things and he was in a position to give them to them. You see, we have... <laughs> We have a minister, a Ministry of Immigration in this country. Uh, they don't in the United States. It's not properly speaking a, a minister of immigration. It's a minister for immigrants. Mm. That's the way that it's worked out. How may I accommodate you? What do you want and what can we give you? More immigrants? You bet. Looser rules? You bet. People who have broken the rules not being deported? You bet. Obviously, bogus people being considered as genuine refugees, that's one of the things that Canada leads the world in. Don't forget all those temporary foreign workers who then become immigrants. Well, yeah, no that's, a, that, that's, yeah that's an issue in Canada, because if you look at yeah. the number of people who come in every year, it's about half a million. And there's only, what, 37 million people in Canada now about 200, 1,000 of those people are supposed to go home, but a lot of them, you know, not surprisingly, don't want to go home. And I'll, I'll mention one situation, which has become notorious in this country, but not as notorious as it should, that Canadians don't want to pay natives to look after their children as nannies, so they import women from the Philippines. And it's made clear to them, and actually, you know, they sign documents saying that they will work here for two years, make some money, and then go home. And a great many of them say, oh, no, it's not fair, because I've really come to love this country and really feel integrated into this country, and I've made a life here, blah, blah, blah. So please don't send me back. Okay, fine, we won't send you back. Mm -hmm. It's immigration by stealth. Right, of course. Is what it is. Well, just to take a step back here a second, the immigration issue, I guess, is the litmus test, really, for the conservative, right? I mean, that is the that is the main issue that they faced in the United States. That was the one where people revolted and turned on the conservatives big time. And I think it's the same in Canada. I don't know. It's It's the immigration issue, really. Because... That's fundamental to who we are as a people, I suppose. It's also fundamental to, you know, what our wages are going to be, what our, what our uh, society is going to be like, who's got the money, who's got the jobs. There is a That's long it. struggle in this country, going back to roughly 1900, particularly, say, in British Columbia, where the capitalists uh, were keen to bring in all these foreigners from Asia to put Canadians out of work and to depress wages. And the labor unions of the time stood four square against this. And Canada went so far as to send back a boatload of Sikhs in 1914. And, oh, Stephen Harper groveled. He made two apologies. And, oh, my God, let's build a memorial to these people who wanted to come to Canada and were told no, because apparently anyone who wants to come to this country 
can come to this country and stay. And the, these boat people come illegally and they pretty much all get to stay. And the handful that are judged uh, not to have valid claims, well, they disappear. Mm-hmm. They disappear. Into the United I, States, actually. After the uh, controversy about Trump's uh, so-called Muslim ban came up, the Prime Minister of Canada issued a statement pretty much saying that anyone in the world who wants to come to Canada can come to Canada. That was a tweet. The, yeah. Yes, tweet. The mayor of Toronto, who is ostensibly a right-winger, said Toronto was open to everyone who wants to come here, whatever religion, whatever country. The Premier of Manitoba, who was a conservative, said, anyone who wants to come to Canada should come to Canada and they will, or Manitoba, and they will be accepted in Manitoba. That it is the, pretty much the official position of our so-called right wing in this country that Canada is such a proposition nation that the whole world should move here. It's Angela Merkel, without acknowledging Angela Merkel's uh, return to uh I guess, a negative uh, position uh, without acknowledging that. They, it's like Angela Merkel handed the football off to Canada, to the, to the kingdom of the cucks. She's now reversing a lot of her policies. We're embracing them, at least uh, on the face of it. They're virtue signaling like crazy. And I think that's probably the most important part, you know. They, uh, the cucks in Canada, well, Can- Canadians, they want to be on the right side of history, you know. They don't want uh, generations down the road to say, oh, look at those horrible Canadians. Maybe we should apologize to that boatload of of uh, whatever came over here and we rejected because... Yeah, as you know. see, if it wasn't for those horrible people in the past, Canada would be 70% non-white instead of only, I don't know, 60. Mm-hmm. I mean, this started... Look, Canadians, despite what they may tell you, are obsessed with the United States and they are keen to imitate everything the Americans do, which is why the rise of Trump has put the fear of God into Canadian cucks. Because, oh my God, if they start taking pointers from Trump, then we are in very serious trouble. Yeah. Well, very this is, serious this trouble. This is why the guy, they had to let that, uh, that guy go, uh, because he used the word cuck. And this started down in the States, and you can't let that infection get in here. You let even a little sliver of that in here and people are going to start going, hmm. I have to make a distinction uh, on the immigration issue and other issues between the cucks and the spurgs. Now, Canada's leading conservative columnist and thinker is a man called Andrew Coyne. And look this fellow up. It just gives you an idea of just how nepotistic this country is. For a quarter of a century, he's been Canada's leading conservative columnist and thinker. Imagine George Will, but imagine someone who is like five or ten times more influential. Coyne believes, uh, I don't know, just open the borders, what, a million immigrants a year, whatever, the bigger, the better. Now, he's not a cuck, he's a spurk. And what counts for the right wing, there are two branches to the right wing in, in this country. There's the cucks and the spurks. The Uh-oh. Spurgs are demented libertarians. Do I have to put the Spurgs on the cover too for this podcast? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no. You don't need to do that. I mentioned Kelly Leach. Kelly Leach is an interesting case. She was a cabinet. She's a pediatric surgeon. Highly accomplished woman. She was a cabinet minister in the Harper government. And she was not known for being right wing or... She didn't really stand out in any way. She uh, she cried a few months ago when she talked about, oh, apparently we were mean to these refugees during the last election because we weren't, I, I don't know, we weren't, we weren't getting all squishy enough. But then she was reinvented as um, this hardliner, well, by Can- in Canadian terms, a hardliner, certainly. And she's uh, what we might call a Trudeau scholar. That, mm-hmm. That's a joke. Some people will get it. Some people won't. Uh, and this, no one has made anything about this because they're afraid to make something of it because then we get the intersectionality battles. But her claim to fame, besides borrowing Trump's attacks on the elite, is that she has called for vetting 
of prospective immigrants to this country on the basis of their subscription to so-called Canadian values. Now, this has been a controversy in this country since our friend Jason Kenney brought out a booklet for newcomers to this country telling them that certain things like female genital mutilation and honor killings and honor rapes, well, you know, we don't do that here. To which my response was, um, you know, barbaric customs come from barbaric people. So we wouldn't have to tell people not to do these horrible things if we didn't bring them into the country. Kelly Leach wants people coming to this country to subscribe to the Canadian values, which I guess means, you know, gay marriage and all the rest of it. This is essentially a liberal position. Notwithstanding that fact, Kelly Leach has quickly become the most hated woman in Canada. And can you believe this woman has the audacity to suggest that people coming to this country subscribe to values which are, oh, I don't know, Canadian compared to, say, Pakistani? Yes, our Canadian values. Yeah. We're so proud of them, except, you know, we don't want anybody to uh, adopt them because that would be mean. Well, they're endlessly, they're endlessly mutable. Well, yeah. Canadian values. It's meaningless now. So. Yeah. Uh, you except know, that it, it has sort of positioned her as the big meanie in Canada. And uh, wow. You know, if, if something does break in Canada, and I, I'm very doubtful it will in terms of the uh, alt-right or opposition, any real opposition, in other words, the return of politics to Canada that we saw mm -hmm. in the United States, you know, uh, she's going to look so mild by comparison, you know. Well, I, I'm going to read something uh, from Salsa Nietzsche's essay. At one time, we dared not even to whisper. Now we write and read Sam as that. And sometimes when we gather in the smoking room at the Science Institute, we complain frankly to one another. What kind of tricks are they playing on us? And where are they dragging us? Gratuitous boasting of cosmic achievements while there is poverty and destruction at home. Propping up remote, uncivilized regimes. Fanning up civil war. It goes on. This is the situation of the genuine right in this country. Oh, you cowards living in your mother's basement, not using your real name. Ha, 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 ha. You know, Gavin Guinness, uh, McInnes, right, makes this charge. And our friend Ryan Landry said, hey, can I have some of those millions you got when you sold Vice? And if I have, you know, a couple of your millions, then I'll, do, I'll use my uh, own name freely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, fanning up civil war, uh, Canada... Canada was very much on board with regime change. We were leading the world in this, that Canada, probably even more than the United States, was central in the uh, illegal coup d'etat in the Ukraine and the installation of a corrupt and illegal government, which, uh, interestingly enough, is backed by the power of neo-Nazis that call themselves the right sector. Now, it's amusing to me that since the election of Trump, one sometimes get the impression that the uh, the neoconservatives are going to have to form a government in exile here in Canada because <laughs> neoconservatism remains strong in this country while it has been critically wounded in the United States. Oh my God, Russia is just the worst place on earth. These same people, these same disgusting people who told us during the Cold War, oh, why are we being so mean to the Russians? They love their children just like us. Now, apparently, the Russians are worse than they have ever been. And why aren't we doing enough to bring down Vladimir Putin? Do you think they really will try to establish a government in exile around uh, Justin Trudeau? That would be hilarious. And by the way, cucks, spurgs, do I have to put neocons on the cover too? No, <laughs> so, no, okay. no. Okay. Just no. cucks. Just cucks. Just all cucks. cucks. Okay. No, it's just, it's just the... Cucks all the way uh, down. I, I mentioned I mentioned a few minutes ago that what I'd like to see is uh, someone say about this uh, Ikra Khalid woman, uh, if you don't like it here, piss off. Now, in the past, Canadians ha have made such statements. And um, some prominent Canadians have made such statements 
Oh, the and the roof fell in on them. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. you had better grovel and grovel as you have never groveled before if you want to save your skin. Mm. That is to say that Canada has become so cocked that even to suggest uh, measures necessary for uh, the preservation of the nation is now pretty much equated uh, with neo-Nazism, notwithstanding the fact that Canada is uh, supporting, uh, including, you know, sending troops over to the Ukraine to support what is effectively a neo-Nazi regime in Kiev. No, we're not consistent. We're Canadians. But uh, I guess this is the way of the cuck, you know. It's uh, a say one thing, doing another. Uh, well, I was you know, just, well, I just I was going to say that yeah. like twenty years ago, you started to hear this formulation from our so-called right wingers in this country. I am fiscally conservative. Oh, that's good, fiscally conservative and socially liberal. Oh, socially liberal. Oh, you've really squared that circle there. Mm -hmm. Except it turned out that uh, when it came to it, they weren't really all that fiscally conservative. <laughs> yeah. There's and what that. social liberal means in this country is mandatory uh, homosexual indoctrination for first graders. Uh, yeah, I'm on board. Look, w what else do you want? Um, Eight-year-olds becoming trannies, changing their birth certificate because the conservative Alberta government passed such a law. Mm -hmm. Yeah, before that, the uh, just, NDP came in power. Socially liberal means, it means revolutionary. Yeah. Is what it means. It means continuous social revolution. Yeah, they are the cultural Marxists. They are the ones that we have to set our sights on. Now, of course, you know, what you've just described has to be squared somehow with Islamic law, I'm sure. Uh, we're going to run into some massive intersectionality problems soon. I wanted to get back, actually, uh, to the uh, Islamic issue because you had talked about the neocons setting up a government in exiles. I don't know, half-jokingly, perhaps. One thing that uh, did come up was this idea uh, that Americans might be interested in this, that uh, CARE has floated the idea of moving to Canada out of the United States or setting up headquarters here because it's a friendlier nation. Uh, has that, uh, you heard anything further on that? Well, you know, I, I, I've heard this. I mean, it makes sense. Mm. It makes sense because if you look at Justin Trudeau, just look at the number of pictures of him with Muslims. Mm. Look at him, you know, squatting on the floor, eating a plate of whatever it is, right? With all mm. those faces. Well, the women are segregated. Yeah. You know, and Trudeau is just such a feminist, but segregating the women, well, here's where the intersectionality kicks in because that's what they do. Mm-hmm. That's what they do, so it's all right, so long as it's they and not us. Yeah, well, isn't that interesting? Aren't they supposed to be us at some point? Now, Trudeau There's famously said that, that uh, Trudeau be, once famously that said that, on, that honor killings were not barbaric. Now, he backtracked on that. <laughs> uh, he backtracked Surprise. on that. Yeah, yeah some, okay. Somebody played back well, what he said. Yeah, but why would you say something like that in the first place? My God, how cucked must you be? Right, but what we saw, what we saw in the run up to the last election, was Stephen Harper's conservatives were committed to this idea, and I've written about this in VDare extensively, and will uh, link to the articles where I've examined the numbers here. That the idea that success in Canadian politics is dependent upon getting the immigrants, or particularly the visible minorities, on board. I'll just explain that. When you talk about immigrants as a voting bloc in Canada, it's somewhat misleading because uh, roughly up until about uh, 1970, the overwhelming uh, proportion of immigrants to this country were white immigrants, and they mostly came from the British Isles. But uh, no, we need to get the immigrants on board. And Harper made this great breakthrough when he won his majority in 2011. In 2011, they won 31% of the visible minority vote. And this is typical conservative thinking. We lose on every sale, but we make it up in volume. Yeah, but they don't make it up in volume at all. And, it, you know, I mean, and, no, I, the I, whole I just prize want, one, of one more thing I've got to yeah, mention okay. here, that the Harper conservatives, these guys, are, well, I mean, conservatives induces brain damage. That they... Harper's government was arguably the most pro-Zionist government 
on earth. They really thought they were going to get the Jewish vote and the Muslim vote. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that, uh, you know, Canada was killing Muslims galore in Afghanistan and Canada seemed to be keen, like, damn, it's a shame we missed getting in in the invasion of Iraq because Harper was desperate to get in on that, you know, and considered a national shame that we weren't involved in that. There's a typical conservative thinking. You know, we bomb them because we love them. Don't they appreciate that? Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, over here, though, winning the uh, winning the minority vote, it's somewhat defensive in a way, because, you know, if you win the vote, then they won't be calling you racist. Whoever has the vote gets to call the other side racist, don't they? And that is, uh, you know, that just hushes the argument, or it used to anyway. I mean, who knows how it's going to happen? What do the immigrants happen? want? The immigrants want more immigrants. They want basically two things, more immigrants, and they want statutory privileges. Hmm. Now, immigrants already have statutory privileges in this country, and Americans may find this fantastic. But if you go to Section 15.2 of the Charter of Rights, there is explicit protection of discrimination in it. That is to say, government discrimination in favor of certain categories of people. Right. And they have been so used, so implied. so. Whatever so. you hear about Canada uh, being based on the principle equality, you tell these people to go to hell, because Canada officially in our constitution is based on the very opposite principle. There you go, cucked all the way down, going back years. We are here to destroy this land. Not well. Canada. Let's let's talk about something that's optimistic now. If you looked at any of the Canadian coverage from our ever-so-wise pundits leading up to the November 8th presidential election, you will find that Trump was um, an idiot, and he was Hitler, and he was a blowhard, and he was a phony, and he was going to lose in the greatest shellacking since Barry Goldwater in 1964 and maybe Alf Landon in 1936. Now, all these people should have lost their jobs. <laughs> they all got it not just wrong, but disastrously wrong. But did this affect their standing in Canadian life? No, it did not. No. On election night, uh, I tipsily suggested that, uh, hey, I'm still here, Canadian media. Mm -hmm. I am available for interviews and for assignments. Yeah. But no, no, no. See, the idea is that only Americans think these crazy and evil things not Canadians. Now, despite the fact that polling continues to show that Canadians are not particularly happy with our uh, immigration rules, procedures, effects, mm -hmm. right. a recent poll, oh my God, there is potential, apparently in Canada, for more anti-racism, anti-refugee feeling. That, that, that's the hopeful side. That despite 50 years, roughly 50 years of being told in an increasingly non-soft totalitarian way that you will do as you are told. There are a considerable amount of Canadians who refuse uh, to, you know, to, uh, to take the pill. Mm -hmm. Now, they have not had a leader. They have not had a leader, and uh, Kelly Leach has been suggested over and over again that she's entirely cynical. I don't know whether she's entirely cynical, and I don't know whether I care, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, because here's the thing. Look at someone like Jason Kenney. Immigrants, we love immigrants. Immigrants are so great. Don't go out and hug an immigrant. You pose for something long enough, and those values become internalized. What we saw during Trump's run for the presidency is that he got stronger and more right-wing as the campaign went on, not weaker. And this was largely because, hey, there's all those people who want this, who agree with me and want more of it. They don't want me to be weaker. They don't want me to be more moderate. They want me to be stronger. Now, Kelly Leach has had surprising success with her uh, anti-elitism campaign, and her she called uh, Justin Trudeau a fringe figure. 
after uh, he Justin Trudeau was. Fringe, fringe well, no, he he was uh, suggested though yeah. she was beyond fringe. Oh yeah, that that there was a see Trudeau reneged on his promise to bring proportional representation to Canada. Blah blah. blah. And he was explaining to some woman, well, do you want Kelly Leach to have the balance of power? Do you want her to have her own party? This is the nightmare scenario, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> that is, in fact, the nightmare scenario of proportional representation, as we see in Israel and other countries where fringe parties have disproportionate power. But hey, I thought you were on the other side of this, Justin Trudeau. He's an idiot. He's a dimwit. This guy, he is unbelievably stupid, this man. <laughs> He's asked, uh, you know, one of these stupid joke millennial oh, confabs, oh, which one of the Baltics is your favorite? His response, is that a, th that's not a thing, he said of the Baltics. That's not a thing. That is to say, he literally didn't know what the Baltics were. And a few months later, Oh, guess what? We're sending troops to the Baltics to provoke Russia. This is the country we live in. Yeah. Yeah. The Baltics thing was so revealing. We've mentioned it several times on this podcast, but, you know, it has to be emphasized. This guy was a teacher for many years, like 20 years before he became an MP. He was an MP for how many years? Four years? Seven, Seven. years? Seven. Seven years. The Baltics had to have come up at some time, you know, what kind of arrogant a-hole do you have to be to say, oh, is that, that's not a thing. You know, he couldn't even well, say lots of, guess I'll, I'll just say know, lots so. of people confuse the Balkans. Uh, yeah, but... The Balkans with the Baltics. But you and don't you see, deny a, they a, exist. A, more, a, a less bumptious fellow mm -hmm. would have asked, you know, put in something there. Oh, give me more information in some way. Like, what, what do you mean the Baltics, right? What? Why do you t say the Baltics? And then someone would have said... You know, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania think, oh, yeah, thanks for that. Now I know what you're talking about. Hmm. That's assuming that Trudeau actually knows what Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania are. And I'm not too certain on that. We have troops there, though, in Latvia. So Yeah, we have troops there. But, well, no, I, I want to say something else about Justin Trudeau. This guy is far too stupid to run a country. And the question is, the question that the media... Our wonderful media doesn't seem to be particularly interested in is who's pulling his strings? Mm -hmm. Who's making these decisions? Because it's clearly not him. Or his buddy Gerald Butts. Yeah, no, it's it's obviously there's some kind of something going on behind the scenes there. Maybe, yeah. Uh, or maybe it's the Aga Khan. Yeah, the Aga Khan or Power Core or who knows. I, I want... To finish up with uh, someone that we haven't mentioned in this podcast, because it is Cucks on the cover, the Kingdom of Cucks, Kevin O'Leary, who many people have suggested since he was a reality show host, is analogous to Donald Trump. He's Canada's mini Trump. In fact, there was an article just recently, I think, suggested that, you know, the two mini Trumps were Kelly Leach and Kevin O'Leary. Kevin O'Leary, he's running for the conservative leadership. Uh, his whole platform is 3% growth per year. That's it. That's all he's come up with so far. Uh, oh, I, I'm a businessman. Yeah. And businessmen have the answers to all the questions. Kevin O'Leary, well, we don't know how much money that he has. It's been suggested he has hundreds of millions of 400 dollars. 400 million, yeah. He did, yeah, well, 400 million. He did one very clever thing in his life. He had this uh, software company. You remember in the 90s, you used to buy things and you'd get all the software bundled with it and it was all a bunch of junk. Mm. And you got tired of wading through 100 programs to find maybe one or two that would be useful at all. Well, that's the company that he had and he swallowed up these other software companies, including some name companies. And, uh, of course, the company was larded with debt, just crippled with debt. And he managed to unload the thing to Mattel in 1999, I believe it was, just before the tech bubble burst for $2.1 million. And $2.1 million? Billion. Sorry, $2.1 uh, yeah. <laughs> billion. And uh, this, had, this had a terrible effect on Mattel, and there was a lawsuit which was settled. That's what uh, O'Leary has done. Again, oh, he has an Arab grandmother, and oh, guess oh, and his father was Irish. Oh, 
I see. You see, he has immigrants on both sides of his family, which is, it's terribly rare in this country for people, Canadians, you know, to, to have immigrant ancestors. No, I, I'm, I'm joking, of course. We're all um, immigrants, don't you know? My mother is an immigrant, and the mother of my children is an immigrant. Like, who gives a toss? But, oh, no, he is, oh, Canada is all about embracing newcomers, and Canada is also apparently about outsourcing to China. Yeah, Isn't that right, Kevin? That. Yeah, that's right. That's what he was known for on that show. What was it, Dragon's Den now? Dragon's Den, yes. It's not one that I watched, but I have a friend who watched it just about every week, and he said, he told me that Kevin Leary was infamous on that show for saying, why aren't you considering building this in China? That's all he wanted to know. He it seemed like that was his mantra. Build it in China. It, it, now that it makes was put sense to him. in a way. It was put to him, uh, what was it, some Oxfam release about the handful of people, relative handful of people owning as much as 50% of the world population. Mm -hmm. Kevin O'Leary thought this was just dandy. Yeah. Because rich people, you know, rich people are the best. Rich people make everyone's lives better. Uh, now, there was, an argu there was an argument to be made for this, mm -hmm. you know, until turbo capitalism kicked in. Rich people now, they recognize, uh, you know, this is Pat Buchanan's argument, and it's true. Rich people, uh, they have no loyalty to communities, uh, to nations, to their own people, to their own workers. They have no loyalty to anyone but themselves. Don't talk about the uh, shareholders, because the shareholders are regularly screwed by these people. Because the uh, board of directors decides that uh, we're going to enrich ourselves and enrich the officers of the company, and the shareholders can go hang. Mm -hmm. But that's Kevin O'Leary for you. He is Canada's mini Trump and uh, one of the leaders in the conservative leadership race. Oh, but it's this so typically Canadian. He's a crap version of Trump. Yeah, exactly. We had a crap version of uh, Ronald Reagan in Brian Mulroney. Yes, we did. So, yes, there we you did. Go. How very inauthentic. Irish eyes are smiling. Is there any hope for Canada? I mean, it is a nice place to live for certain things. You know, it's not crowded. Well, you uh, know, Scarborough, my grandparents uh, used to live in Don Mills in Scarborough. And I visited them uh, in the 60s and 70s. And they were nice places to live. They're not nice places to live anymore. Mm -hmm. I live in Victoria, which is still a nice place to live, having been chased out of Vancouver, which is no longer a nice place to live. It's just, I don't know, this question of uh, you get tired of running mm -hmm. because um, they'll catch up to you eventually. No, I, I think that force majeure is going to solve the Canadian problem. Mm -hmm. I, I, we may have mentioned this before on the podcast. Canada is based on this system of transfer payments. It sounds fantastic, but it's robbing Peter to pay Paul. Yeah. And uh, Peter doesn't have any money anymore. Right. And Canada is in exceedingly deep waters. Uh, not that our media is going to talk about that because, uh, you know, any of the systemic, to use that word again, problems that Canada has, the media takes the, uh, the Homer Simpson approach which is to hide under a pile of coats and to hope that everything will work out. <laughs> oh, yeah. I just want to point out, uh, Ricky Vaughn just recently said uh, on in Gab that uh, we shouldn't really be wasting our time uh, going after the Antifas because they're losers and uh, they've lost, they're dispirited now. The real problem are the conservatives, the cucks in the United States. Well, I just want to say we've got the similar problem, only I guess much deeper here in Canada. And if any of you trolls get bored with your own country down in the United States, well, don't look north, because you certainly couldn't have a lot of fun trolling up here. No, Ricky Vaughn is, is absolutely correct. The cucks have always been, the, the internal traders uh, have always been more of a difficulty, more of a threat than uh, externalities. Mm. Yeah. They've always been. Because these are the people that you know. These are the people that you grew up with. These are the people who are the responsible figures in your community. And they say, come on, come on, do the right thing. You know, it's good for you. It's good for everyone. You can trust us. Yeah, that's them. 
Uh, I'm going to stick in, of course, a link uh, uh, at the end of this uh, to a site that we have mentioned before, National News Watch. That's where you Americans can go if you want to go see a broad section of the Canadian media. And if you want to have any fun, you know, some fun poking holes in... Uh, or you can see a list. Yeah. You can see yeah. a list in a column of articles. Yeah. Trump. How bad is he? Next story. Worse than that. Next story. No, much worse than even that. Or, yeah. and then the final story. Is it physically possible for someone to be as all-consumingly evil as Trump is? Scientists investigate. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Have some fun with it, kids. We certainly will. Anything else you want to add before I uh, shove this off the cliff? Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm going to uh, do my little bit. Mm -hmm. It's been, you know, I'm looking at Twitter and what's happening there, and it's been suggested to me that I don't know what I can expect to be on Twitter for all that long your days are numbered i well no i'm pretty i am pretty moderate on twitter yeah you know i don't engage in racial abuse i i, I don't get into uh shit slinging matches uh with people that sort of thing but uh apparently i'm on lists two have been created I'm at yeah. 106 on the uh, 500 Nazi scalps list, and apparently there's this other uh, list going around the internet where I'm at 133 of the worst people on Twitter. I think that's because uh, you no, win a I'll, lot I'll, of arguments and you don't back down. No, I, I will say this. Look, if some sort of legislation is passed in this country such that I'm not allowed to criticize uh, Muslims or homosexuals or whoever... I am, as they say in the law business, judgment proof. I have no income and I own nothing. So I'm not paying any fine. So if the Canadian government wants to spend $120,000 a year, or 150 or whatever it is, to put me into a minimum security prison, that's all they got left because they got nothing else to get from it right there you go thought criminal all right then with that a uh, rather dramatic pronouncement from my co-host kevin michael grace i will say that this is the end of episode 70 of grace and steel i'm kevin steel and i'm the still uncaged kevin michael grace <laughs> <laughs>